My name is Pap Guy and I'm the CEO of IntraHealth International and I will be the moderator of this session today. So welcome to our session entitled Health Workforce Investment as a Driver for Universal Health Care Coverage and Economic Development. If you are in this room, like me, you are probably very passionate about the human resources part of development and the issues of health workforce. You are also probably worried that we are not making enough progress or the progress is not fast enough. I assume you are in this room, you believe, like me, that if we don't solve the health workforce crisis, chances are we're not going to meet our objectives including UHC, including the HCDs, the S SDGs. If you, are like, if you are in this room, you probably believe that we can do a better job articulating how we can engage the private sector. And finally, I am sure you will agree with me that we need to do a better job about community health and primary health care at that level and solving the distance that we created while thinking that primary health care is not really part of the system, whereas it is the foundation of the system. So welcome to our session this afternoon. We're delighted you've joined us. We, we have a great turnout and we have a very exciting afternoon. Uh, without further ado, uh, I would like uh, to invite Professor Takemi uh, to get us started. Professor Takemi is a member of the House of Council of Japan, a senior fellow of the Japan Center for International Exchange, and a long-time champion of human resources for health. In fact, uh, I met Professor Takemi when he was chairing the board of the old Global Health Workforce Alliance, which we will have a chance to talk a little bit uh, later in the program. So, Professor Takemi, come and uh, welcome us. I'd like to thank all of you who have gathered here for this discussion today, including the Honorable uh, Kwek Ajiman Menu, the Minister of Health of the Republic of Ghana, and my long-standing friend, Professor Francis Omaswa. I'm pleased to know that uh, you are uh, rewarded as a Noguchi Prize. Uh, this is the wonderful occasion. And then, as well as the co-organizer IntraHealth International and the Japan Center for International Exchange. I am particularly pleased to be able to introduce this event on health workforce investment as a driver of universal health coverage and economic development. This allow me to speak to my work as a member of UN High Level Commission on the Health Employment and Economic Growth, and the most recently as WHO Goodwill Ambassador for the Universal Health Coverage. As all of you are well aware, each country's health workforce forms the backbone of its own health system. Health workforce is a critical component for the universal health coverage that also underpins many other important social goals such as gender equity and empowerment, inclusive growth, employment and education. However, investment in health workforce, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, have fallen short of what is needed. The African continent experienced nearly a quarter of the total global disease burden 
unfortunately, but has only 3% of the global health workforce with which to address its disproportionate health needs. Many country, ma many complex reasons for this, which are further complicated by recent trends in population aging, migration, brain drain, and new and uh, recurring epidemics of the infectious diseases. We will focus on a number of key bottlenecks today. One of these is the importance of the quality data in building a dedicated and capable health workforce. The data points I just referenced, which are still widely quoted in the health workforce literature, are from the WHO's 2006 World Health Report. This is the most recent comprehensive analysis we have. Now it's 19, uh, 2019, we still use 26 world report. Another bottleneck is the quality of care. To improve quality, we need to address the issues of working conditions, burnout and attrition that continue to challenge health work for scale up. The finally, the gender imbalances persist both within the health workforce and in health outcomes. Globally, the woman comprise 70% of the health and social care workforce. Many serve as the frontline health workers and are the first point of the contact between the rural or low-income communities and their health systems. However, nearly half of this work goes unpaid and unrecognized. Investing in the health workforce recognizes how important it is to maximize human potential in achieving social protection and well-being. We are seeing a renewed focus on this approach through initiatives like the World Bank's Human Capital Project. This people-centered approach, something Japan has long been committed to having adopted human security as an overarching concept of guide its foreign policy in the late 1990s. It is important that this discussion is taking place on this sideline of TICAT 7, which is an interdis interdisciplinary collaboration between African nations and Japan that focuses on how strategic joint investments can address shared challenges and pave the way to achieving shared goals. Among these shared goals is universal health coverage. A major driver of economic growth, which in turn helps to build social and political stability. This very much includes the cross-cutting benefits of the health workforce investment that we will discuss today. I believe that we have the opportunity before us to drive the collective action and toward increased investment in African health workforce. We will thereby pursue our shared goals of universal health coverage, human security, health and well-being for all and ultimately achieving our sustainable development goals. I really hope that this ticket seven give us the wonderful occasion to increase our political momentums commit on the global health, specifically those the health workforce issues. And then we can strengthen our health system as much more resilient, especially in African continent. I really hope that the coming discussions here have a really meaningful and having the real political momentum in the future. Thank you very much for your patience. I'd like to invite uh, now um, Honorable Kwaku Ajeman Manu, uh, Minister of Health of Ghana. 
we are really lucky to have him, knowing that Ghana has really been one of the pioneering countries that have decided to tackle the HRH issues uh, decades ago. Honorable. Thank you very much, my brother. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the 21st century, I understand, is the age of design. This will involve the design of institutions, agreements, and most importantly, redesigning our, our health workforce to make them fit for purpose. One of our key bottlenecks in our inability to achieve all the health-related MDGs was partly due to inadequate health professionals of high quality. In order for us to achieve the SDGs, we need highly qualified health workforce in appropriate numbers so as to achieve universal health coverage. Ghana has embarked on the process to develop a UHC roadmap. We have defined UHC as follows. All people in Ghana have timely access to high quality health services, irrespective of ability to pay at the point of use. Investing in our health workforce is one of our key priority actions. The growth and development of a nation largely depends on the health of its nationals. The vision of the Minister of Health is to get a healthy population for national development. Ghana's National Health Insurance Scheme was established by an Act of Parliament in 2003 to provide financial risk protection against the cost of basic health care services for residents in Ghana. In the past 15 years, Ghana has made substantial progress in its quest to attain universal health coverage. Active membership of the scheme has increased from 1.3 million in 20, 2005 to almost 11 million in 2018, which represents about 38% of our population. So we still have a lot more strides to make. The health insurance scheme currently is the financial backbone of Ghana's health delivery system and engages over 4,000 healthcare providers, both public and private, accounting for about 85% of their internally generated funds. It is not surprising that Ghana is often considered an example of global good practice. Despite the successes shocked over the years, the scheme is confronted with some key challenges. Amongst them are the human resource challenges. Currently, Ghana has a doctor population ratio which has seen some improvement from 1 is 8,003, that is our 2016 indicator, to 1 is to 7,196, which is what recorded by a close of December 2018. However, in 2018, the nurse to population ratio recorded 1 is to 8,301, 2016 indicator, 2,796 as of 2018. The nurse population ratio was 1,839, which is better than the WHO recommendation of 1,000, one, sorry, 1 is to 1,000. The challenge that, however, remains is the equitable distribution of the staff. So we have done a little better in the front of the next time it will free uh, our workforce than actual medical doctors' workforce. We have very few health workers in our deprived and hard to reach areas. To improve upon this, we have commenced an electronic recruitment based uh, system which will allocate to various areas on very equitable basis. 
I am proud to say that health education offered in Ghana qualifies the health professional to work in any part of the world. And this makes the Ghanaian health professional very attractive in the global labor marketplace. Um, to achieve health, I mean, universal health coverage, we positioned ourselves years back to actually focus on primary health care and um, create facilities closer to the people in rural communities, smaller ones. And in view of that, we invested in establishing a lot of training schools for the caliber of nurses that can man uh, these facilities to actually provide primary health care um, services. And that is what is explaining why we have done that better in the front of uh, nurses' health care services. At the moment, we are positioning ourselves even to export some of the nurses that we have because we are expanding anyway. But it's like we have several colleges that are training. We have set up a um, college to train, I mean, specialists even in nursing. And that is giving us the workforce that we actually need. And it looks like we are overproducing. At the moment, we are even training students from outside our country in some of our nursing colleges. I thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to move now to some stories uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa. And I would like to invite our panelists uh, to join us up here. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Samson Olum, who is the Acting Head of Human Resources Management at the Ministry of Health of Uganda. Dr. Janet Murioki, a colleague of mine. <laughs> Who is a deputy chief of party and technical director of an HRH project in Ghana uh, and in uh, Kenya, and uh, Dr. Marie Nagai, uh, who's going to be here to share experiences from Togo, from work she has conducted in Togo. And uh, without further ado, we would like Dr. Samson to start his presentation. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> uh, before I commence this presentation, I'd like to pay homage to my permanent secretary, who is Amidis Asia, and through our moderator, I'll make this presentation through her. That is Dr. Diana Twine. Uh, to go straight into my, our story, so basically our focus is going to be how you how Uganda has used data to inform uh, its human resources for health policy, and uh, also how it is investing in human resources for health. To start with, for those who don't know where Uganda is, Uganda is found in the eastern part of Africa, somewhere there. And this is the map of Uganda. I looking at the snapshot statistics on Uganda. Uh, Uganda is characterized by high population and population growth rate. Currently, our population estimate is 44.7.27 million, and our growth rate is at uh, 3.2 per annum. And uh, with a projection by 2030, we expect to have 
a population of 63 million. Again, we are characterized by high disease burden. This is HIV, malaria, NCDs. And then, of course, we have also challenges with the skills in terms of numbers, distribution, and production. Um, the other aspect is the challenge of productivity of our health workers. We have the challenge of uh, performance of our health workers. We have issues uh, to do with leadership and management. Of course, you also have the challenge of motivation and absenteeism. On how uh, Uganda has used data to inform some of its uh, HRH policy, I'll pick on gender issue. Um, in, in 2013, Uganda conducted a, a gender discrimination and inequality analysis where it was established that our health workforce is composed of 53% women and 43% um, are men. However, the challenge of this composition is that the women uh, compose the lower positions in the structure, and the men, who are the lowest in terms of percentage, constitute three quarter of the top positions in, the, in our health structure. Further analysis uh, of that study, out of those respondents, it was established that 30th 32% responded having experienced sexual harassment. So with that, the ministry came up with the gender mainstreaming guidelines and sexual harassment prevention guidelines. The other area that human, uh, Minister of Health use uh, data to inform policy is on occupational health and safety, where in the 2000s, Uganda had a challenge of Ebola, where we lost quite a number of our health workforce. Out of 45 health workers, Uganda lost uh, 17 health workers. And to that, the ministry came up with the occupational health and uh, safety policy. And today, with the recent uh, uh, breakout of Ebola in our neighboring country, that is DRC, Uganda took up a, a, a strategy to, immunize, to vaccinate all our frontline health workers in those frontline districts against Ebola uh, virus. So with that, I move straight on how Uganda is investing in human resources for health. In as far as investment in human resource is concerned, uh, Uganda has taken a bold step to address the challenges of uh, specialists as a country, we faced uh, a challenge of having most of our, uh, our patients with chron chronic illnesses going, to, going outside Uganda to, see, to seek specialist treatment. And with that, the, the, the ministry now wants to uh, prioritize the investment in specialists, and these will be trained locally within the country. Uh, that was the analysis that was done in as far as the specialist is concerned where we have a gap, a 61% specialist gap, and 83% of specialized supportive, supportive cadres as per the establishment. Yeah, so locally, the country is going to start training medical specialists to, to, to cover up the gaps that exist uh, in the structure of uh, the health sector. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pap. Uh, for me, this afternoon, I'll be sharing the story about uh, Kenya and the Afielimu Fund. Uh, Kenya is located in the East African region uh, with a population of about 10,000, uh, sorry, 50, uh, 50 million uh, people. 
uh, we currently do have a critical shortage of health workers, especially those of essential services at the mid-level uh, uh, health professionals. Uh, we currently have um, 15 health worker per 10,000 population, and this is well below the WHO recommended of 23 per 10,000. Uh, the challenges, uh, uh, in addition to this particular challenge, is that uh, we do have maldistribution of our health workforce, majority of whom prefer to work in the urban setup compared to the rural and uh, uh, arid areas. Uh, it will be therefore critical for Kenya to increase its health workforce population uh, for purposes of responding to universal health coverage. And to do this, we must increase the health workers in production by 50%. But with medical education, there is a challenge in the training. One, that it's costly. It costs about 4,200 4, to 4,500 US dollars to train a mid-level health profession through a three-year program. And that is within our public sector, our Kenya medical training uh, colleges. And this will cover for tuition fee, uh, accommodation, and of course their upkeep. The tuition alone, for a, a three-year program will cost about uh, 2,500 US dollars, which is usually beyond the reach of most uh, needy families and of course uh, in view of the uh, issues of poverty. And this is one of the reasons where we are having high dropouts of our students. One, they may not be able to take up their opportunity once admitted. Secondly, uh, they may um, defer uh, their training for purposes of um, uh, going out to earn more money so that they can continue with their medical education. And then some just fail uh, totally and uh, pull out of the system through a uh, dropout. Uh, so in response to this, uh, next please. So in response to this, uh, the Ministry of Health, IntraHealth, USID, the Ministry of Education through the Higher Education Loans Board and the private sector, mainly here bank cooperatives and also uh, foundations, have come up with the Afia Limo Fund. The Afia Limo Fund has the goal of increasing the number of mid-level uh, health professionals who can get financial assistance to uh, pursue medical education. Uh, the Afia Limo Fund benefits mainly uh, students uh, such as nurses, clinical officers, health records, uh, nutritionists, and lab technicians. It is also serving the benefiting institutions are our mid-tertiary level, both the public, the private, and also the faith-based organizations. Uh, the fund manager for this, because of their legal mandate, is the Higher Education Loans Board through the Ministry of Health. They receive all the money that is coming from these uh, uh, contributors, and they operationalize the day-to-day -day of the fund. So the process begins with an advert that is run twice a year, uh, one for new students, and the second one for those who are continuing with their medical education. That means they have already received this loan in the past. We do have an oversight uh, structure that is a governance body that ensures identification and selection of the students based on a mean testing instrument that looks at their vulnerability, are they orphans, are they needy, and are they coming from the arid and uh, rural areas of Kenya. Once the students are confirmed, they are then uh, at the medical training institution, we then do the transfer of the resources to the respective training institutions and the students can begin uh, to undergo uh, their training. So this is the current uh, performance of the fund to date. It grew out from a scholarship, uh, uh, a scholarship system, but because of the issues of sustainability and revolvability of the fund, it was converted into a loans product. The loan is a four interest, uh, is charged at four uh, four percent interest, unlike commercial uh, loans in Kenya, which run at about twelve percent interest. Currently, we have about 1.6 million US dollars that have been put together by the various contributors, benefiting 22,000 students uh, ever since the inception of the fund um, uh, since 2013. Uh, currently, the students that have are in training are about 14,000. 
those that have graduated are about 2, 000, uh, 8,200, and those that have uh, in employment about 2,500 of them. And the loans are being repaid by students, about 2,200 of them. And currently, about half a million US dollars have been realized from the Afia Limu Fund from the repayment of loans by the students after a one year grace period. That half a million US dollars now is able to cater for about 450 uh, students. However, there is a challenge, and that is because for us to utilize this 1.6 million US dollars, we have had to provide the students with only part of their tuition fee. That means we are covering about 1,200 US dollars for a three year program vis-a-vis -vis 2,500. And the demand for those students who are actually not getting their loans stands at currently uh, 6,000 students who are failing to have that opportunity to benefit from the Afia Elimo Fund. So this is really critical for us next, uh, because in response to SDGs and UHC, the critical cadre, which is servicing dispensary and health centers, is the nurses at 43% of the fund. We do also have clinical officers at 19%. And then, of course, the other cadres, the health records, the medical lab, the pharmacist, the nutritionist, are some of those we really need to build in response to UHC. We are projecting that there's an opportunity for this fund to service at the community level for community health extension workers and also uh, for the subspeciality, for example, nurses in critical care, uh, family medicine, uh, amongst others. So our call is to next uh, to uh, contributors to come into the fund, identify with these values of investing in the health workforce for purposes of addressing universal health coverage. Thank you. Now, um, this time I'd like to talk about uh, one network, not only one country, but 13, about 13 countries in Francophone African uh, place. And uh, I'm here uh, in place of uh, the coordinator of, the, of that network, um, Director of Resource Human in Togo, uh, Mr. Kajanta. He couldn't come, so in, instead of him, I'm here to explain wh what this uh, network is doing, have done, and how my organization on Japan have collaborated with them for the last 10 years. Yeah. So this is the member states of this network. There are 13 countries. You see that blue eight countries have started this network in 2012. And then gradually, uh, the other Francophone African countries requested to join. So now total 13 countries. And the origin of this uh, network uh, was a training program in Japan, which invited and eight countries, Director of Human Resource in Ministry of Health to Japan, and my organization, National Center for Global Health Medicine, developed that uh, training, and JICA supported. Yeah, thank you. And this is uh, the current secretariat in this organ uh, network. And in addition to Mr. Kajanta, the coordinator in Togo, you see that administrative secretary from Niger, uh, he is also director of human resource, and external relations in uh, Mr. Mushu Claude from Burkina Faso, and finance officer, uh, Madame Jan from Burundi. Uh, you wonder why finance officer? Because to become a member of this uh, network, you, uh, each member needs to pay cotization. So it's not uh, just waiting for money to do something from donors, but they have a very strong will to do something by themselves. So they are collecting money by themselves, but of course, uh, so far JICA and uh, my organization is not a donor agency. We, my organization is provide technical assistance, or in other words, running together, accompanying with them. And uh, 
one good news for them is that they, uh, this organization was a network was uh, recognized as an NGO in Senegal. So now they are really independent organization. Uh, next, yes. So I will talk about the, the first training in Japan in 2010, because that was the beginning of this network. This is a house model, which was developed by our organization, NCGM, in uh, 2010. When we talk about the problem of human resource uh, here and there, we shouldn't focus on a narrow area. But we have to think about a whole framework. So as you can see, the roof of this uh, house is a, a health need in the population. And we need a human resource to support this health need. And which sub what is a supporting pillar means the production, deployment, and retention. If it doesn't work well, we, we have all problem what we have currently. And to support these three pillars, uh, the foundation is the Ministry of Health Capacity because it's their res responsibility uh, to uh, provide a good finance, legal framework, and policy and planning in terms of human resource in that country. And monitoring and coordination is also cross-cutting things. Thank you, it's already four minutes. Okay, so using this framework, next please. The participants uh, from eight countries analyzed what their country's problem in 2010. This is the re result of the problem. So they named this house as a house of Francophone Africa uh, with all problems. And in, especially they said that the inappropriate information system of human resource and uh, issues of production, retention, uh, deployment, and retention are the issue. Next, please. However, in 2012, they reunite again in Dakar and decide they have to tackle. Instead of pro, uh, creating the house of problem, this is a house of solution. So they named it as a Francophone African House of Solidarity. And at that time, they declared the official establishment of this network. And they made a five years plan to tackle this, uh, to implement this solution one by one. Next, please. This is one of their achievement. In terms of health personal information system, they, they did a lot of try and error. And, and uh, IntraHealth has a one software which called Iris. And some countries started, but they couldn't expand from pilot stage to na nationwide stage. At that time, I lived in Senegal, worked with the uh, Minister of Health in Senegal. We decided, OK, we have to uh, modify this software extensively for this country's context. Senegal succeeded. They, used this ex they shared this experience with the network and supported other countries to modify. Thank you. Uh, next, please. This is the result as of last September. In their meeting, last year meeting, they checked which country had a, a shared, a, has that, a, already shared that software in that country, which country had a national ownership, next part, and which country already modified it for their national context, and which country is actually using it for everyday management. This is the result. And you see the 2014 Ebola outbreak. Do you remember those, that one? In Senegal, fortunately, they already expanded this uh, modified software in whole countries. When Ebola outbreak started, they quickly identified who is working at the border area. And, and that was really correct information. So they quickly trained those people, and they could uh, control the Ebola nicely. Next, please. Another example. This is a retention and maldistribution issue. And uh, yeah, thanks for the support with uh, Madame Maeda sitting here. The Senegal decided to conduct the research. They asked us to support that research because they didn't have that capacity. We conducted a qualitative and quantitative research 
to identify what kind of policy is really needed to retain the people in a rural area. One of the findings is that there was not good national mobility guide, guides. So people didn't want to go because they don't know uh, how long they have to be there. They developed the guide. They shared that guide within network. They supported other member countries to develop that guide. And now they are monitoring. <laughs> Next, please. This is a result in 2018 using the uh, House of Solidarity. They, evalu they evaluated by their own activities. The red is they haven't done yet. The blue, they have done it. As you can see, there are a lot of red part in production or in other words, quality of health workforce. So they are now targeting on the production or quality and asked us to help the another research and we will visit Senegal soon again. Next, please. So this is the last slide showing the next, uh, last year's the general assembly. And uh, yeah, I'm there with the same clothes and there are some Japanese supporting these uh, activities. Their challenge is mainstreaming of health workforce in member country and financial sustainability. They said that they have to demonstrate how effective this network is instead of funding each country separate. They have a strong will to monitor, implement and monitor by themselves. <coughs> so they, this is their message. And uh, the last message is uh, from Mr. Kajanta, who couldn't come, but he asked me to share this message. Our network is rising up in this global momentum. Time is life. Life is time. And next meeting is October to, uh, to 4, next month, two months, in two months. And every, anybody is welcome, is with your own expense, please. And with budget, that will be nicer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and thank you for keeping up with the time. I think our, all of our presenters have been very good with time. So uh, I'd like to suggest that we go straight to the, to the discussion. Uh, so I'd like to, to thank you. Maybe you, you can join in uh, a little later on. If we have questions, we'll call you back. And then uh, I'd like to invite our three discussion, um, Dr. Jimmy. I understand you need to go first because you will you'll have to go, and um, yep, have a seat. The Dr. Akiko Maeda. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, you want okay. So we want you to have your remarks.皆様こんにちは。ただいま あの、3名の、あの、先生方、そして基調講演も来まして、4名の先生方の、あの、大変下に飛んだご講演、誠にありがとうございました。
、まあ、それに関してでありますけれどもあの我が国がまあ戦後70年というふうによく表現をいたしますけれども、まあ、この戦後70年にわたってまあどのようにまあ保険の分野をまあ発展させてきたかということと照らし合わせてのコメントをさせていただきたいと思っております。あの日本の場合はあの医師、歯科医師、薬剤師という歴史は非常に古いんでありますけれども実はあの1961年に、えー、ユニバーサルエルスカバレッジ国民皆保険が導入をされて、まあ、そして保険財政が安定してきた、まあ、その背景には、まあ、安定的な経済の成長があったわけでありますけれども、まあ、その1960年以降でありますが、まあ、大変あのコメディカルの発達人材の発達というものがあります。でそれはあの資格制度を確立してきたということでありますで特にあの文科省と、まあ、そしての厚労省が、まあ、相対手を携えて連携をして資格を作って、まあ、そして文科省で作った資格をそれを保険分野に供給するという仕組みを、まあ、試行錯誤を現在もしているところは当然ございますけれどもあの構築をしてきた歴史があります。栄養士の制度ですとかあるいは STOT と言いますけれどもスピーチセラピーですとか理学療法士こういったさまざまな資格制度を充実させることで今ではノンコミュニタブルディジーズということが大きな問題になっていると思いますけれども感染症の克服の後のこのノンコミュニタブルディジーズに関してはこういったのコメディカルの協力がなくしては私たちの日本のユニバーサルヘルスカバレッジと同時にこの地域包括ケアと言いますけれども地域の中で保健人材とともに患者様を支える生活というものは成り立たないわけであります。そういった意味でもあのお話を伺いましたウガンダの保健人材の不足に関しましてはあのまずはまあドクター、あるいはナースといったあの主,主たる保健人材の確保ということだとは思うんですがあのぜひ中長期的には、まあ、そういったさらなる他のあのコメディカルの育成ということにも視野を入れてあのぜひ今後お考えいただければありがたいというふうに思いました。またあのケニアでございますけれども都市部に人材が集中しているという課題を伺いましてこれは実に日本も共通している課題だというふうに思いまして伺いますとこれは実はおそらく世界で共通している課題ではないかというふうに思いますその中でも地方において働いてくれる保健人材に対して大変に支援を経済的にも支援をしているという取り組みをご紹介いただきました。あのまあ、これとこのケニアの取り組みと、まあ、そしてあの最後に永井さんがお話をしてくださいました、まあ、フランス語圏の人材の分,分析ということがありますが、まあ、これのいわゆるど,こどうやって地方での保健人材を確保するのかという共通の課題に関しましてあの私、大変日本でも活かせるヒントをいただいたと思っております。それはあの日本でもあの保健人材の地域偏在というのは大変大きな課題でございましてその中でもあのやはりいつまでその地域に配置されるかわからないと。いうとなかなか行きたがらないということがございます。で、日本の場合は特にあの家族を持った後の世代でありますと、まあ、そこの教育がまあ、中学校まあ、小学校、中学校、高校という高等教育がまあ、きちんと施されるのかということで、まあ、保健人材が地方に行くのをま嫌がる傾向があります。でその時も、まあ、どのぐらいの期間お願いをしますと言って戻ってくるこれはの私たちは往復切符という表,表現をいたしますが往復切符であればあの行って帰ってきますということがあのよく言われておりますので、まあ、ここのところはあの丁寧な聞き取りによって、まあ、このアナラシスを完成されたと伺いましたけれども日本でも全く同様の課題であると思いましたあのいずれにいたしましてもあのユニバーサルヘルスカバレッジあの武見恵三先生をはじめとした多くの,あの先生が方とともにあの私もあの日本の国の課題と同時にあの世界の課題に対してしっかりと目を向けていきたいと思いますあの4人の皆様の貴重な講演誠にありがとうございましたThank you, thank you very much. And I would like to thank、uh, Intra Health and the Japan Center for Integrated Exchange for having the honor to speak、uh, in front of you.
Um, I think we have heard a lot of very interesting and promising stories, and the situation is certainly uh, progressing well. I think it's important to link workforce with UHC. We have mentioned it several times, but let's not forget the objective. Today, we have a shortage. We have a, an issue with universal health coverage. Half of the global population doesn't have access to quality health services. 3.5 billion people. It's a lot. Of course, uh, this is linked to the poor quality of health systems and the different component of health systems, including, of course, infrastructures, equipment, drugs and access to medicines, financing, but very importantly, very, very importantly, the workforce. Without health workers, we are not going to progress on, on health systems and we are not certainly not going to progress on universal health coverage. So it's really time to, to move on this agenda. I think that uh, we have heard also from the Minister of Health of Ghana that uh, focusing on primary health care is certainly a way to move this agenda forward. And certainly the WHO encourage all member states to take primary health care, particularly in the African region, as a way to address the issue of non-access to quality health services. So what we know is that globally, we are going to produce, or that we expect to produce 40 million health workers by 2030 to achieve universal health coverage. It's a lot. It's a lot, and we can see that here we have many examples that go in the direction of this production. Because uh, indeed, for the moment, the situation is not very good. We have some countries that do very well, the well-off usually, but we still have a lot of low-income and middle-income countries that are facing issues. We estimate that we have a global shortage of 18 million health workers. It's really a lot. A lot. And uh, with regard to TCAD and the reason why we are here together, six millions are of this shortage is in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is exactly what we need to address. We know that different countries have different solutions and we have seen it. And uh, we had also uh, good examples of initiatives like the initiative of, of Ethiopia. We know it's possible to do things, but we need to accelerate it. Certainly we can do it also with the SDG gap. Um, but still, in some countries, and we mentioned uh, Western Africa, but we can say that in the Sahelian countries for the moment, we have a major, major concern that the density of medical doctors, nurses, midwives, and other health workers is less than 1.5 for, for 1,000 inhabitants. 0 0.3 in two of those countries. It's really an issue. We, we, ca we cannot let it like this. We will never achieve universal health coverage. This percentage explains that in those countries, the population, 40% of the population only, has access to quality health service. We need to, to change it. We need to do something. But, of course, we have good news. We have good news that since we had the high-level commission on health employment and economic growth, we have demonstrated that investing in the health sector can lead to good results. And we have another good news, is that this employment is particularly beneficial for women and for the youth. So we have a message here. Guys, let's invest in the health workforce. We have some uh, good data on that. The Women's Budget Group has demonstrated that 2% GDP investment in the health sector increased overall employment by 1.2 to 3.2%. That is really fantastic. We have also a recent study in, uh, in Côte d'Ivoire by WHO and ILO that shows that an increase in health workers' salaries expenditures of only 1% increased the GDP by 0.56%, 2.5% household income increase, and an increase of the overall employment by 0.32%. So only increase in the health workers' salaries by 1%, meaning increasing by 1% the workforce. So this is really, really very important. I know the time is up. 
and I will conclude now that, uh, of course, investing in the health workforce is essential and that it is consistent also with the World Bank human capital priority and the IMF focus on social spending. And in that regard, I would like to insist that the ratio in collaboration with the OECD and ILO through the Working for Health program is supporting uh, countries and uh, we'd like every country to benefit from this. And that in the UNGA in New York, we'll have a side event on this. And of course, all of you are invited to this side event. Thank you very much. Our last discussion uh, will be somebody who doesn't need any introduction from my, in my books. Uh, Dr. Akiko Maeda, formerly with the World Bank, but uh, now as, a, as an independent uh, health economist. Akiko. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor for me uh, to be able to meet up with old friends and to make new uh, friends here. My name is Akiko Maeda, and I had until recently worked uh, with Dr. Schmidt and others in WHO and OECD ILO on this working for health investing in human resources for the future. And I wanted to make um, a two comments uh, with regard to what has been said before. I think we've had tremendous uh, presentation. There is great interest and motivation in investing in human resources. And we've focused a lot on the shortage. But what do we mean by shortage? It is not always just about the shortage in the supply of workers, although that is a huge issue, of course, in most countries, including high-income countries. Please remember, the shortage of, of health workers, of skilled workers, is a big problem in higher-income countries as well. And this is something to keep in mind for all of us. But we have to think about the quality of the jobs themselves. Even if you have highly qualified number of, of graduates, if the jobs that are being offered are terrible or dangerous or unattractive, it's not enough. So governments and professionals, let us work also towards creating quality jobs. Quality jobs means decent wages, but also respect and equitable way in which responsibilities are dealt, equitable and fair ways in which we treat one another. So quality jobs is an indicator that OECD has been developing for its own health, well, work, not just health, but workforce in general. It's another set of indicators that I think needs to be looked at in, in more depth. The other issue that I would like to raise is on the skills and competencies. We've talked about the doctors and nurses who form the core of the current healthcare workforce. But as you know, the world and the technology is changing so rapidly that the, the future workforce may not be divided into doctors and nurses and technicians. There's going to be a huge change in the kind of skills that are going to be required. And I had the opportunity when I was working at the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is for the higher income countries. But the findings of that study I worked on, on skills for the future health workers, I think is relevant for all countries. And there are three types of skills that I think we all need to pay attention to. Uh, the OECD calls them the transversal skills. Sometimes they have been referred to as soft skills, but we decided not to use the term because it seems uh, rather demeaning to talk about soft skills as if this is secondary. In fact, the skills that I'm talking about are just as core and critical as what's considered the hardcore skills, the technical skills. The skills that I'm talking about have to do with teamwork. How well can you work in a team, in a complex, multidisciplinary team? That's number one. Number two, emotional intelligence. How good are you, how capable are you in understanding the emotional context, understanding also your own emotional vulnerabilities, and learn how to manage it. It is often forgotten that health workers are people too. They're not just machines that churn out services. And they are under tremendous stress. And we have to understand your own vulnerabilities and to learn to work in a team to address 
these difficult issues in healthcare, which often have to do with end of life issues, which may have to do with um, conflict issues, um, very, very difficult issues. And yet, in most medical schools, nursing schools, this is not adequately addressed. And in design of management, these emotional issues are not adequately addressed. So designing human-centered and emotion-centered protocols will be critical. And then the third part, which is what we all talk about more frequently, is on the complex problem solving, the new technologies, which is creating more opportunities for solving difficult health and medical problems. But it is also creating new challenges in dealing with these uh, big data, AI, artificial intelligence. How do we harness this technology? Well, the OECD study finds the more high technology, high tech interventions come in, actually there is an even greater demand for higher interpersonal and emotional skills. They go hand in hand, without which you do not have a successful service. So what I wanted to throw out to you is, yes, there's a shortage of health workers, but it's not just about the, the head count and numbers. We need quality jobs for the workers, for safe working environment, and for them as human beings to have emotionally rich and resilient working environment and skills to deal with this. I think this is what we have to work towards, and investment is, should be in these areas of investing for human beings who care about human beings and who are both emotionally intelligent and technically competent but also a great team player. What a great challenge for all of us to face. I hope that we can succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Akiko. And um, I want to thank you guys for being so patient. I know you've been taking in a lot of information. But we designed it. I, I agree with you that we have a nice flow. Um, would like to do the last section of, uh, of this session, which is I'd like to invite Dr. Francis Omaswa. We are so delighted to have my brother, my colleague, a real champion uh, for the health worker. Um, Dr. Omaswa was the first director of the Global Health Workforce Alliance, which we know was the mechanism that was put in place uh, to ensure global governance of these touchy issues. And, uh, and I, I think we have a lot we can learn from him. And we are also delighted that he is the recipient of the Noguchi Prize, which uh, he will be receiving uh, this week uh, in connection uh, with TICAD. So uh, in the next 20 minutes, uh, the two of us will be having a conversation uh, made up of reflection, his reflection, uh, and I will be trying to probe uh, about where should we be taking this whole movement and, and this issue. Dr. Maswa. This one is working. We can, uh, we can share that better if we have two. OK. Dr. Maswa, again, congratulations for being a recipient of, uh, of I think this is a testimonial of the great work you've been doing. Um, I'd like your thoughts because what you did with the Global Health Workforce Alliance is really focus on that, on that global governance. And I think you had some good results because we had the first global forum ever, which will happen in your country, Uganda. Uh, we went on to have the, 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 the Thailand, and then we had the Recife conference. 
and more recently Dublin. So we really, you were able to mobilize the community in big ways. What are some of your thoughts today as you think about global governance of the workforce of HRH? And I would like you uh, also to think about it in terms of universal healthcare, because I think UHC has kind of taken over. Uh, so what thoughts do you have and what would you like to share with our audience? Well, uh, thank you, my brother, Pape, uh, and all of you uh, for caring enough about this topic and being here. Because as uh, 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 we heard just now from uh, Akiko, uh, I think it is more than just counting numbers. It is about what is in your heart about helping people to remain healthy and those who become sick to get better from their illness. And uh, health workers are interfacing with human beings and it is so critical that uh, they are trained in such a way that uh, they feel for the people they serve and very important also that the people they serve also feel for them. It is two way and sort of like uh, growing up in the health system in Uganda from colonial things were much better. I felt they cared for me, they paid me enough salary, I could buy a car, I could build a house, but it's no longer the same for various reasons. So now, when we come to look at where the global governance and the global movement uh, came from, we reached a stage when there was uh, enough mobilization globally. And I'm pleased that uh, my a colleague, uh, Professor Takemi, was among those together with Lincoln Chen and uh, Tim Evans and uh, J.W. Lee and so on. Uh, we were able to create a leadership which was able to put this agenda on the global table. That is what happened. And it moved for some time. We made those achievements, but including uh, enacting uh, WHO code on the international recruitment of health personnel, which we would use for making sure that each country is self-sufficient. And if they are not self-sufficient, they can share with other countries through negotiated bilateral agreements. And those who migrate are looked after. The code is beautiful. But can you imagine that as soon as the code resolution was adopted by the World Health Assembly, they closed the Department of Human Resources for Health in Geneva. They said they had no money to employ people. And the implementation of that code was therefore not followed up immediately because there was no leadership. And the Kampala Declaration and Agenda for Global Action had six recommendations. The very first one was calling for leadership for health workforce, building leadership for health workforce. And if you ask me what is the single most important problem, this is it. Leadership for health workforce has gone down. And if we are going to change this, we need to build leaders as uh, levels of uh, uh, heads of state and presidents and then professional associations and then, uh, of course, uh, country governments and so on. And we really need to do this with evidence, with information. So that is how I see it. The enthusiasm went up, it has come down. We need to pick it up again. Do you think that the enthusiasm uh, maybe did not go down, but it was kind of overtaken by the conversation about universal health care, universal health access? Uh, maybe not, because if you look at everyone talking about universal health coverage, you just heard Gerard say so. Everyone says so, no universal health coverage without health workers. 
Correct. Everyone is saying so, but what is the action? It is similar to our campaign for increasing health budgets in countries. When we talk to parliaments, to politicians, no one disagrees that health is not important, that it's not a priority. They all agree. But then when you say, let's give, add more money to, for health, it doesn't happen. Mm. So you, you, you think that there has been a loss of momentum? Yes, there is a loss of momentum. What, let, me, let me focus on African leadership mm. on this subject. Yeah. Because it's, I think unless we get that, just like you said, yeah. what's your assessment today mm. about how well the African countries are doing in owning this problem? Mm. Yeah, at that time, we had that momentum. We developed the African HRH strategy uh, in 2012 to 2016. But it has not been updated, so you can see what it is. We also developed the African Health System Strategy by the African Union, all this. But it, it, nothing more is happening on this. And then the health workforce densities. I think one of the speakers here pointed out that, um, in fact, the study 2010 uh, to 2006 and then again uh, 2016, health workforce densities in Africa have not changed despite all that big campaign. And sadly, in some of the countries like the Sahel you are talking about, those densities are going down. So when we talk about the global health workforce crisis, it is there, it is real. And really, uh, African leaders, uh, I think they also like the global leaders. And it's very interesting, Papa. Um, when uh, I, I was a member of uh, a committee who were advisors to Ban Ki-moon when he was Secretary General, and what we were telling him, asking him, is when you meet heads of state, African heads of state, what is your conversation about? Do you talk to them about uh, the health of their people? Or do you talk to them only about security, stopping wars and crises and so on? And uh, his answer was that uh, it was mostly about solving crises. That is what they talk about. But to his credit, Ban Ki-moon, before he left the office, is the one who established that high-level uh, 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 committee on, uh, on, on health workforce employment. So uh, that is uh, certainly credit to him. So I think that we need to make a new beginning on this agenda. And we now have data. We now have also a big push on universal health coverage to link the health workers as the drivers of the health system. You know, when you give us money to buy drugs, you take money to the global fund. and. The Global Fund gives a grant to the country to buy coatem for malaria. Coatem cannot move from the airport where it has arrived to the mouths of sick people on its own. It's so obvious. But why does it not happen? So we are also now, of course, calling for activism. You know, the HIV experience. Then at that the, the height of uh, HIV, the HIV affected people with their friends just made it impossible for anyone else to remain in peace unless they listened to them. They went and disrupted meetings and they were shouting at everyone and come on, you must treat us and they got treated. Can we now talk for those other so many people who are dying without access to a health worker? and create that pressure, that urgency, that universal health coverage, leaving no one behind, is something which we should all commit to and make that pressure be felt at all levels. So I am actually very moved by a couple of things I, uh, that I wanna, want you to comment on. One is, uh, Akiko was actually calling us to look into opportunities. Because I think 
One of the things that has happened in the last couple of decades or so, we have focused so much on the problem. And we have kind of closed our eyes on maybe there are opportunities out there. And when I think about Africa and where Africa is in its development, Africa is the continent that has the fastest uh, economic growth. And uh, we are seeing really a boom happening. What are, in your opinion, the opportunities or the, the, the positive development that we could use as new tool or new language so that the problem is not just, again, Africa has the poorest statistics and, you know, we've, we've got the largest, you know, burden of diseases and we have the few. What are some of the positive things, including also the vibrant youth that we have on this planet? What are some of those, what, what do you see as we look into the future? What, what could we be promoting? As I see it, the most um, significant opportunity is the SDGs. The SDGs. SDGs, we have a target, a timeline. When Africa got independence 60 years ago from colonialism, the leaders, African leaders at that time, were very hopeful, very ambitious. They said, we will rid Africa of disease, poverty, and ignorance. So that enthusiasm should come back. And we need to start with a mindset change of our leaders, a mindset change of our professionals. We have strong professions, uh, doctors' association, nurses' association. We have strong civil society organizations. These are the, op the people we should drive and mobilize to create the pressure which will make uh, universal health coverage a political choice. And Africa is full of young people, full of young people. So in terms of getting them trained, we had the story from Kenya. They can't afford to pay the training uh, uh, fees. Uh, so we need to invest in education, invest in education. And in fact, education and training is the single most important intervention to producing a global pool of health workers whom we can share through the code. So uh, uh, Professor Takemi, I would like uh, you and others like you to uh, call for investment in health workforce, which is tied to the health systems. No one, like Global Fund, should get money from Japan if they do not have a program to support health system and health workforce development. All, everything uh, should be proofed for health workforce. Health workforce in all policies, in all actions that we do, because if we actually train the type of health workers like Akiko is talking about, then those are the people who are going to be change agents like the, that, uh, I think you were a member of that uh, Lancet Commission on the health workers for the future. You know, we need them to be experts, professionals, and change agents. So investment in training is a key opportunity. And Africa has a lot of young people. If uh, Japan is short of uh, health workers, nurses, and so on, there are potential Japanese health workers there in Africa. So, so I know we only have a, a few more minutes. Um, could we spend that talking about community health workers? And because the reality is that uh, we're going to be working for a long time to have the numbers that we need when it comes to professional or doctors, midwives, and nurses. And I think there's a lot we can do with community health workers. What are some of those things? Well, the, I think the first point I would like to make on that, and uh, Gerald, you take this back home to Geneva. There is the threshold of four, uh, uh, four point, uh, is it 2.5 uh, per thousand doctors, nurses, and midwives. Let's erase that recommendation and that threshold. Because there are other skills in Africa, actually, in Uganda, Kenya, where the people who are providing health services are neither physicians, doctors, or midwives, I mean, neither physicians, nurses, or midwives at 
community level. We have uh, allied health workers, you know, clinical officers, laboratory assistants, pharmacy assistants, and those people are given with the skills which they need. So in terms of community health workers, I would like to present it as community health systems, yes, that's, that's of which community health workers are part of that. Yes. And if we focus on strengthening health workforce for community health systems, with the little resources that we, can, we have now, we can achieve SDG 3 in Africa. But it must become a vigorous movement which is driven very aggressively by all countries. And how can we get that to become? Because it is possible. It is possible, provided that sufficient action is taken. The human resources are there, the knowledge is there, but the will is what we lack. Okay. So you call to action for this community? You call to action? All of us, you are here because you care. Go from here, inspired, to go back home and make sure that no one rests until the issue of reaching the health of the poor through health workers who are supported, who are skilled, and who, uh, this J.W. Lee, his summary was, our job is to provide a motivated, skilled, and supported health worker for every person in every village, everywhere. So that is our journey. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for everything you continue to do. I know you can be an inspiration for many of us and many of the young people to continue the fight with this. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, uh, Professor has made my task of uh, just concluding this session. Um, so I'd, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to just share a few thoughts as we conclude this session. Clearly, there is urgency. Clearly, there is urgency to act. Clearly, we should not be taking another 50 years to get to where we are today because we know that we have the knowledge, we have the resources, and we, we really have the know-how. And I think we have gotten smarter in the way we partner. So I'd just like to leave you with some thoughts. I do not think it's realistic to think that the public sector alone should be charged with the responsibility of making the health workforce situation better. I think every one of us, regardless of where we sit, should do our part. Whether we come from the public sector, whether we come from civil society, or whether we come from the private sector, which is also something we need to harness. Not just for the money that we think exists in the private sector, but imagine how fast we can go if we can leverage the know-how that exists in the private sector, if we could leverage the management skills and the discipline that exists in the private sector, then I think we can move faster with this agenda. I think WHO and ILO, through the HIG report, through the commission, has given us new language that we should use that language is very appropriate for Sub-Saharan Africa today because people are seeing economic growth. They are seeing economic development. We are seeing urbanization. Our populations, our families, are understanding what it means to be able to care for your family and pay for the schools, for the kids, and so forth. The language of economic development works. The language with healthcare is something we had to do because we have to eliminate the diseases. But we are getting there. 
If you believe in the Landsat 230 report, we are going to move to this convergence where we're going to have, we're going to be able to control communicable diseases to a certain level. Of course, we have non-communicable disease, but we have some new language around economic growth, which I think we can use. And I really urge us to think the way Akiko is thinking, is that let's think positive about this and let's think opportunity. No one knows what the health workforce of tomorrow will be like. I think we should not assume that the health workforce issues that we're dealing, walking into the future, we know in fact they're not going to be. We know that with technology, we know that with AI, that's going to be a different world. So thank you again for keeping up with this subject. I think you're absolutely right. If we don't solve these issues, chances are we're not going to get to UHC. Chances are we're not going to get to, S to reach the SDGs. But I believe that together we can do that. I believe with smart partnership, with harnessing the passion that we have and harnessing the lessons learned that uh, Professor Maswa just shared, we can accelerate progress because that's really what we needed. So thank you for coming to our session this afternoon and have a good evening.